everyone. I'm Jeff Timbro, and this is uh, SPX Flow webinar. Uh, we've called this one Take Your Brewing Process for a Spin. Uh, we're going to cover our Cytel centrifuge line and how our units can fit into your process. So a few housekeeping notes. Uh, everyone's mics and cameras are disabled. Uh, I kindly ask that uh, you pay attention to the presentation. And as you do, I'm sure you're going to have questions. So please feel free to drop those into the chat and I will go through at the end during our Q&A and answer them. So uh, my name is Jeff Timbro. Uh, my parents call me Jeffrey. Uh, you can call me Jeff. Uh, my contact information is there on the left. I'm going to show it again at the very end. Uh, a little bit about myself. I live in uh, Wethersfield, Connecticut. When people ask where that is, uh, easy answer, I'm between Boston and New York City. So uh, put it simply. Uh, my background is uh, process engineering. Uh, I've done process engineering since I graduated school. I've worked in a lot of food plants. I've worked in breweries. I've worked for customers. I've worked for engineering firms. Uh, I have a technical background, so I'm always excited and understanding to talk with you about your application. So. Uh, when you reach out to me, I'm going to work with you. Uh, I'm going to work with our engineering team, and I'm going to figure out the best configuration of our centrifuges for your process. So our agenda for today, uh, just in case you want to tune in and out, uh, we're going to talk a little about the history of Cytel. Uh, we're going to talk about our partner, Trucent, who handles our aftermarket and commissioning. Uh, going a little bit into the theory of operation, uh, and then dive into uh, what the centrifuge is mechanically, and then some application and some of the advantages that we can offer you. So in 1983, uh, Cytel was founded in Santorso in Italy. Uh, if you ever want to go on a nice vacation, you can go over to Venice, uh, check out some uh, cool things underwater, and then head over and see some cool centrifuges. Uh, they started off uh, processing milk, uh, so that's where we say milk and whey skimming. When you go to the grocery store, uh, you're probably going to buy 1% milk, 2% milk, whole milk, skim milk. And basically, uh, we don't have cows that can produce 1% milk, 2% milk. So we're going to take that milk that the cow produces and use one of our centrifuges to separate the cream from the skim. And then we're going to precisely remix those back together so you can get exactly, you know, the cream percentage that you want. So that's where we started. Uh, we had about 3,000 3, centrifuges installed at that point. In 1988, we dived into uh, wine and beer. And then, you know, continuing to develop the process over time, develop our units, uh, get in, we got into uh, oils, essential oils, biofuel, industrial oils, stuff like that. Any place where we want to se separate uh, kind of particulates from a liquid or separate liquids of different densities. And then in 2012, uh, Cytel was acquired by SPX Flow. And uh, 10 years later, here we are. So let's get a little bit into uh, the theory of uh, what is a centrifuge? How, how does it work? Uh, what's the purpose? You know, what, what are the driving forces? Um, so the first thing to consider is sedimentation versus centrifugation. Um, we all derive these from uh, these theories from uh, Stokes' law, and uh, you know that's that's the force of viscosity on a small sphere moving through a viscous fluid. So basically, we need to start with how is stuff going to move through the liquid? And for you, stuff might be uh, you know bits of hops, grains, flocculated yeast. How's that going to move through the beer? We have to take into account densities, the density of those particles in there, and we have to take into account the viscosity and density of your fluid. So if you've ever uh, really paid attention, uh, water flows very nicely. If you imagine water or gasoline or, you know, pure alcohol, uh, which is nice to augment drinks with, um, they flow really, really quickly. But if you take something like honey or molasses, you could kind of dump it onto the counter and it'll kind of form a pile and spread out slowly. So it has a resistance to flow. So you can imagine if you put something in there, that something, a piece of sand, uh, you know, a, a piece of grain, it's not going to move as easily through that liquid as it would through water. So with sedimentation, we take that relationship between the particles and the liquid and then uh, take into account the force of gravity 
and that figures out you know kind of how fast that particle is going to settle to put it in perspective if you were to take sand and uh, sprinkle it in a glass of water it's going to take some time to to settle in at the bottom and some things might move slower than others uh, if you walk away for a couple hours even a day you'll come back you'll see all the sand has settled to the bottom that's driven by gravity gravity is is the force that's that's causing that particle to settle to the bottom and it's doing that because it's more dense than the liquid um with a centrifuge you can see on in, in these equations on the right uh we have the same relationship uh correlation between the fluid and the liquid but we've substituted the force of gravity with a rotational force so uh that allows us to put get more energy uh driving that particle to to travel through the liquid than just relying on gravity alone so you can see here we can make a few assumptions uh just to as a comparison uh with the centrifuge spinning at 8000 rpm uh with you know a little less than a foot radius uh, we can achieve 10 times almost 11 times the force of gravity to to work things uh through the liquid so with sedimentation, we're relying on gravity to, to it's not bouncing the stuff, but it's it's drawing it down through through the liquid. Uh, in your case, it would be grains, you know, kind of settling out slowly over time uh, to the bottom of the tank. Uh, with centrifugation, we're spinning it and quickly uh, forcing those those particles, those solids, can be hop leaves or whatever, uh, out to the edges of, of the centrifuge. I always like to compare this to you know, the car carnival ride where uh, you know you're stuck stuck to the wall. It spins around. Everybody's sitting there, and you find yourself uh, stuck to the wall of the ride. Sometimes they're even angled up. So as the thing spins faster and faster and faster, you slide up the wall wall of this this carnival ride. Um, in the case of of stuff in a centrifuge, we angle those walls down, and and that stuff is sliding down to the edges. And, that, and that's through the 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 the, the, the centrifugal uh, acceleration being being imparted on everything. Another comparison you can find in in uh, kind of outside on your day to day life. You've never maybe never really thought about it or noticed it, uh, but uh, when you take something like rain is is falling on a parking lot and it's it's washing away stuff like sand and rocks and cigarette butts and leaves and whatever you know whatever could be there. Uh, we don't want to just take all that. Uh, water with all that trash in it and, and dump it somewhere. So we want to settle it out. And the and these these settling areas can typically have uh, plates in them uh, to to increase the residence time and increase increase the resistance of of that stuff being able to flow out wherever we're trying to actually transfer the water. Now, if we were to take one of those and tilt it on its side and start spinning it, basically have a centrifuge uh, for your beer. Uh, don't advise doing that. Those things are dirty. You're putting rain, rain, rainwater through them. Uh, you might want to talk to us and have us uh, supply you with a you know, precisely engineered centrifuge to do that for you. Inside of our centrifuges, we have what's called a disc stack. Uh, basically, it's a lot of metal cones stacked up uh, with space between them on top of each other. And what this allows is an increased area, equivalent area of separation, as we call it. Uh, if you imagine maybe dropping something into the middle of a five-gallon bucket <clears throat> and then spinning everything, that particle is going to need to move its way, you know, through the whole radius of the bucket before it hits the edge and, and you know, gets drawn down to the bottom. Well, when we use a centrifuge with these discs we're splitting that flow coming into the centrifuge into many many channels so then particle doesn't need to travel as far it you know quickly let me pull up my pen uh, as it's flowing through uh, as as the centrifuge is spinning it's going to travel up these channels work its way out to one of those discs and then be forced down and out and i'm going to show you soon you know where those solids go uh, with the balance of the liquid is able to continue to to travel up these discs and back out the centrifuge. So by increase the num increasing the number of discs, we're able to increase the equivalent area of separation and basically do more work on on your fluid 
uh, than just relying on, you know, one or two or, 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 or nothing at all. So here's a little uh, kind of diving in. We've we've split it into into one disk uh, just to give you a, a better uh, perception of what's happening. But basically, our liquid is flowing down the center center into the centrifuge out to the edge. Uh, remember, there's a difference in density uh, between our liquid and these particles that we're trying to remove. Um, the particles are going to try and travel up. And, and leave the centrifuge. They, they want to move with the fluid flowing through it, but because of that centrifugal force, uh, they're instead forced to the edge and they travel back down and out of the centrifuge. As we go further and further out uh, from the center of the centrifuge, there's more and more energy. If you remember the equation, uh, as the radius increases, there's more and more centrifugal force on the particles. Uh, so at the center, the flow's not moving too much, but once we get to the edges, uh, there's a lot of force there. To put into perspective for you um, of, you know, how a liquid, uh, your processed fluid, your beer, uh, might change in a centrifuge we have uh, shown here, uh, over time, uh, what that product would look like in the centrifuge. So. Uh, please note this is is from like a benchtop centrifuge. So in a benchtop centrifuge, something we use to test to see how the unit's going to work. Uh, we fill up a bunch of tubes with samples. Uh, we put load them into this 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 uh, you know testing device. It's a piece of lab equipment. We spin it around really fast, and then we take the tubes out and we look. And what do we see? So after right when we put the the sample in there, you can see all the way to the left here. The Liquid looks pretty uniform. It's it's hazy. Uh, there's stuff in it, but there's uh, you know no clear real delineation of 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 one thing or another. So you know solids versus liquids. As we spin it for for time, you can see that stuff starts settling out. So at 30 seconds, you can see some lines starting to appear, uh, continuing on. After 10 minutes in the in the in a benchtop centrifuge, you can really see what we've separated out. So all that uh, denser solids have have worked their way to the bottom, and at the top we have a nice clarified liquid. So now let's talk about a centrifuge mechanically. Uh, what's going on inside? Uh, what are the parts? What are the pieces? Well, one of the first things we need to consider is how do we make it spin? Uh, there's lots of ways to move energy around. Uh, in the case of a centrifuge, on our smaller units, we use what's called a gear drive. Uh, so the energy is is transferred from our motor uh, into this gear that's coupled to a vertical shaft. Uh, so energy, the motor's spinning, it's spinning this gear. That gear transfers its energy to this vertical shaft, and then that vertical shaft is what's attached to the bowl and makes it spin round and round. As we go up in model size, uh, we transfer this energy with a belt. So instead of the gear that's causing that shaft to spin, we take a motor, we spin a belt that's wrapped around our shaft, and that shaft's attached to the bowl, and the bowl spins. Uh, something special about the way we do this is uh, the way we've aligned our vertical shaft ball bearings uh, really, really mitigates any sort of vibration or off-centeredness that you might have. Uh, if you think these things are hundreds and hundreds of pounds, they're spinning very, very quickly. Any slight deviation uh, in the alignment of that shaft could cause it to start vibrating, which frankly isn't pretty. Well, the way we've designed our bearings and placed them, uh, we're able to keep that shaft aligned and keep everything running smoothly and nicely. Uh, one more thing to note is after that, as that shaft spins uh, at the bottom, uh, we have our oil and that oil kind of splashes up and keeps everything lubricated and, and moving nicely. So an exciting new development, uh, we've recently released our direct drive units. Uh, so if you think about energy transfer, we talked about uh, transferring that energy with gears. Then we move to transferring that energy with belts. Well, all those kind of points where you're combining processes are, are places where you lose a little energy. You lose uh, energy to things like friction. You have the, the gears rubbing together, or you have the belt uh, running around and rubbing and, and, and losing some energy. So we've recently released our new direct drive centrifuges where the motor is directly mounted to the bottom of the bowl. 
Uh, these are a little easier to maintain. Uh, the motor is easily replaced. There's no gears to align and, and belts to worry about. Uh, the, 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 the motor is mounted directly to the bowl and allows it to spin. Well, it doesn't allow it, it causes it to spin. And you can see here a little uh, more, puts it in perspective with the gear drive. Uh, we're spinning a motor, it's spinning on a vertical axis, it's, it's going into a gear, uh, which is then causing the bowl to spin on a horizontal axis. With the belt drive, we have the motor uh, spinning a belt round and round, and then it transfers over to the, to the shaft that causes the, the bowl to spin round and round. Well, with the direct drive, we just have a motor spinning our bowl. And now how it works. Uh, this is a good slide to talk to you about what's going on inside of the centrifuge. So it's a cutaway. Uh, and let me trace out the, uh, you know, what, where your beer would be flowing, what would be happening, how it's, how it's working. So we take your beer, we come in the top. This is pumped uh, from upstream from a, from a tank of some sort. There's multiple points in the process that we can install one of these and all of them have slightly different purposes and and different value adds so uh, we're bringing it from somewhere bringing it down through the center of the centrifuge and then down here it gets uh, dispersed through the plates uh, if you remember i mentioned this is a disc stack style centrifuge uh, where we have a lot of these discs stacked up on each other the flow is going to flow through the discs the solids are going to work themselves back out come to a rest on the outside of this bowl and the clarified beer is going to be discharged through back through the top of the centrifuge and then you can send it really wherever you want to well we're accumulating solids here and you might be wondering well, what happens if i'm running for a few hours uh you know i have a lot of grain that made it through or i decided to use a lot of hops in my recipe i have a highly flocculating yeast you know isn't this thing going to fill up well, the answer is yes. The, the solids are going to accumulate in the in the in the bowl of the centrifuge. But we've thought about how to address that. And the way we design our centrifuge is with this split bowl design. So let me go ahead and clear off my my pen. And I can talk about this a little better. So as solids are accumulating on the outside uh, of the bowl, we need to get rid of them. Uh, during commissioning, uh, we are going to pay attention and see because you have different formulations. Uh, you're going to need to know for yourself, uh, you know, how, how fast are these building up? And, and where you see that is uh, once the centrifuge fills up, it, the solids are going to have nowhere to go. So they're going to go out with the liquid. You're going to fill up and the solids are going to leave and, and it's going to start looking cloudy. So what we've done is we've created this, this split bowl design. Uh, where we can actually drop out the bottom and allow those solids to leave the centrifuge. And this is done with water uh, that actually holds it up into place. And with some precision, precision switching of the water path, we allow that bowl to fall out and those solids to be discharged in what we call an intermittent discharge. Uh, the timing of this is all automatic. Uh, that's something we figure out while we're commissioning. Uh, I'm going to get to it soon. Uh, different upgrades we can offer to automate that process. So, you know, you might you might have varying uh, styles of beer. You might have process uh, conditions where you see, you know, a sudden increase of solids in there. So that timing is all controlled by the PLC to make sure that the centrifuge is discharging uh, when it needs to. So you have a nice clean beer coming out. Another little cutaway, just to make that a little clearer, uh, you can see on the left here, uh, the centrifuge is closed, the solids are accumulating. And on the right, we've switched to a discharge where we've allowed that uh, bottom piece to fall out and the solids to come, come out of the centrifuge. Uh, the, these, these flow of water is, is controlled by some small valves. And in our design, uh, we've placed them behind this little door, so there's no complete disassembly required of our centrifuge to get at those water valves and service them. I uh, simply remove that little door, and then you can remove the valves, inspect them, or replace them as needed. And now our seals. Uh, the seals are fairly important in a brewing process, depending on where you install the centrifuge. Uh, you may be more or less sensitive to oxygen pickup. So 
Uh, when you're less sensitive, we would use a typical hydraulic seal. Uh, some of the product kind of holds itself in here in the seal area and uh, allows everything to spin while still sealing it off from the atmosphere. Uh, this also allows us to mitigate the risk of any of that sealing liquid, like water, uh, ending up back in our beer. Has a oxygen pickup typically below 100 parts per billion. Uh, for when we are more sensitive uh, to our oxygen after fermentation, we don't want that yeast getting started again. It's it's used up its its oxygen. It's started doing the nice route of uh, respiration where it produces the good stuff, alcohol and beer. Uh, we might mount a hermetic mechanical seal. So for a hermetic mechanical seal, our typical oxygen pickups are around five to 10 parts per billion. And we do this with water. Uh, so by feeding water in, it's, it's still separated from your process. Um, and actually the excess water is discharged into the bowl. So this has uh, much less oxygen pickup and also much lower CO2 losses. So if you have a carbonated uh, if we're at the point in your process where your 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 beer is carbonated, we don't want to be losing that carbonation. Uh, we would plan to use a hermetic mechanical seal. Uh, we're talking about a clarifier. Uh, you know, in the in the beer industry, uh, what we have is we're going to have uh, beer coming from different points of the process. Maybe it has uh, grains in it. Maybe it has hops in it. Uh, maybe it has some flocculated yeast in it. And all we want to do is remove those solids. Uh, we're not trying to remove any oils. Uh, it would be an interesting beer if you had uh, dumped a bunch of oil in it that you had to remove. So we're just discussing a, a liquid solid separation. So we have liquid coming in the top, some solids leaving the machine, and then a liquid stream leaving the machine. Uh, the other centrifuges we offer that I don't get into, ta into today would be something like a separator where we have one liquid stream coming in that could be milk and we have two liquid streams coming out. They have different densities. One will be cream, one will be the skim. And then we always have some kind of solids uh, that are accumulating in the centrifuge. In, in milk, it could be cells, uh, could be little bit bits of dirt from the cow's udder, bacteria, stuff like that. Uh, those solids will always need to be removed. Uh, but in our case, uh, we're just talking about a clarifier. So uh, different separator centrifuge applications, some advantages that we, we can offer. Uh, first, I'm going to get into uh, the different points in the process that we could use uh, beer uh, centrifuge. Um, they fit in a lot of places and all serve slightly different purposes, but really the takeaway is they're all removing some solids from uh, the beer. So after your wort kettle, uh, maybe you, you, you have some, some grains uh, making it through your filter bed. It didn't settle like it need to, or just some always come out. Uh, we want to remove some of those grains. So, so after the wort kettle, we can use a centrifuge on the hot wort uh, and remove some of those solids. We can use a centrifuge after the cooler uh, to further remove solids. Um, as some of you may have seen, uh, as you cool a liquid, some stuff starts to settle out uh, that wasn't really apparent at the beginning. Uh, we can handle that with a centrifuge. Uh, after fermentation, after your yeast does its work, some of it dies, it lived, it laughed, it loved, um, and now it settles out at the bottom of your fermenter. Uh, you're pumping it out. You might still have some of that flocculated yeast suspended in your beer. You don't necessarily want to give that to a customer. Uh, so we can actually centrifuge out those yeasts. Uh, we can even take that uh, tube and centrifuge out some beer from there to increase your efficiencies. And then from our storage tank, uh, we can use a centrifuge as a pre-filter or a main filter. Uh, it can be upstream of a diatomaceous earth filter or it can fully replace a diatomaceous earth filter. So, so now some options uh, that we offer. Uh, it's never as simple as it looks. Uh, there's always things around in the process you need to consider. So in the case of our centrifuge, if you remember, uh, we need to feed it. Uh, we're not going to want to change the flow to it as we're running, um, bring it up and bring it down. We want to feed it at a fairly constant rate. Uh, we can do that with a feeding pump. Uh, if it's easier, we can supply the feeding pump. An outlet turbidity meter. So. The purpose of the centrifuge, obviously, is to be removing uh, those solids from the beer. Uh, we don't want the beer coming out to be as turbid. Uh, maybe we do in the case of a hazy beer. 
Um, so we put a turbidity in line and that would substitute for the sight glass. Well, you could still have the sight glass so you could make a visual, visual inspection, uh, but a turbidity meter allows us to automatically monitor uh, how, how clear that, that liquid coming out of the centrifuge is. We can offer product recirculation. So if you remember, uh, during our intermittent discharge, those points, those timed points in the process where we want to expel the solids that we've accumulated into the centrifuge, it's a very brief, quick function, but it does set the centrifuge a little bit out of whack and uh, stirs up some of those solids that can leave the centrifuge. It's not a large amount, but if you're very sensitive to that, we can actually recirculate the product leaving the centrifuge during those fractions of a second, bring it back into the top and make sure nothing gets downstream. Furthermore, we can offer modulating valves on the inlet and the outlet of the centrifuge to control flows and pressures. All of these options are available together in a configuration we call autopilot. So if you wanna kinda set it and forget it configuration, we can offer autopilot. It's gonna monitor your turbidity, it's gonna monitor your flows, it's gonna monitor your pressures, and it's gonna make sure everything stays where it needs to be. You can easily do this uh, by standing by your centrifuge and monitoring everything. Uh, they really should not be babied that much. Uh, occasionally, you might want to make settings. And if that's, it's a simpler configuration. It's a cheaper configuration. And for some people, it's all you need. Uh, so that's why I'm here is to work with you and figure out, you know, what, what your requirements are, what your dream system looks like, what your budget is, usually the most important question, uh, and figuring out uh, what configuration works for you. Some other options we offer. Uh, if you remember, those solids need to go somewhere. Uh, for some, uh, we can just dump them out the back of the centrifuge into a floor drain, into a bucket. Uh, it's usually a waste product. We're not trying to handle it too carefully. Uh, but if we really need to move those solids somewhere and get rid of them, uh, we can supply a, a solids discharge pump that's installed in the rear of the centrifuge. And as you fill up on those discharges, it helps move them away somewhere else. And also our, our Oxy Zero configuration uh, introduces a stream of carbon dioxide to further uh, mitigate oxygen pickup and CO2 losses. So this is a pretty nice configuration, especially when you're very sensitive uh, to oxygen pickup uh, during process upset conditions like a discharge or something like that. Uh, we make sure we've, we've really mitigated the degree of oxygen we pick up in our unit. So now some of our advantages and a pretty cool cutaway of our of our centrifuge looks like, what are they, running a brown ale through it that day? Uh, definitely not a hazy IPA. Centrifuges offer a fairly rapid and efficient clarification. Uh, so you can flow through these pretty quickly and do a nice job clarifying your beer. Uh, we can offer an interesting configuration where we install the centrifuge on a skid. Uh, this is typically standard. Uh, then it'll really, really facilitate the installation of a unit. If, if it comes on a skid, you can have it arrive on site in the morning and have it running by the afternoon. The alternative would be to kind of break apart the concrete a little, install mounting plinths, mount the centrifuge to those, level it. It's fairly difficult and there's, you know, from an installation side, there's a great justification to get it on a skid. Uh, it's got self, not self-adjusting, but adjustable feet uh, you wheel it into place, uh, maybe with a fork truck, drop it down, make sure it's level, plug in your flows, plug in the electricity, and you're good to go. Our centrifuges are very stable. Uh, we don't need to do a back flush, uh, diatomaceous earth filter. Uh, as you accumulate, you might need to back flush it, resettle it, and then eventually replace that diatomaceous earth uh, with a centrifuge. Uh, you really shouldn't need to replace the plates or anything in there besides making sure your oil's where it needs to be and you have your operating water. Uh, so there's a savings there. Um, we don't have to just use a centrifuge to remove everything from your beer. There's a high demand for hazy beers these days. I'm up in the Northeast. I know about Treehouse Brewery. Um, pretty good if you haven't had it. I recommend it. Um, but they have a hazier... Uh, more citrusy beer. So by adjusting the, the pressures on the centrifuge, we can control the degree of, of the stuff we are removing. So if we want to leave some haze in there, we can do that. 
Moving on to other features, benefits, and advantages, I just want to uh, drive home that a skidded solution really has a large benefit uh, to the installation of the centrifuge. And even if someday you want to shift around your brewery, you've added some fermenters, uh, you're moving to a new location. Uh, with the centrifuge being on a skid, you can just lift it up, move it, get ready to go. Um, we can customize them. Uh, that's why I'm here is to work with you to figure out what's best for your process. Uh, perhaps a simpler, uh, more inexpensive unit will handle what you need to do right now. And then as you grow, you might want some automation. You might, might want some additional process monitoring. That's all stuff we can work with you on. Uh, because of our design of the shaft bearings, we have a high dynamic stability. Uh, this minimizes vibrations. Uh, vibrations can cause you to go down since the centrifuge is very heavy and spinning very quickly, uh, kind of quiets it down. And any vibrations or stuff like that can cause a need for maintenance. So your maintenance requirements are also mitigated. Our centrifuges are soundproof. Uh, they're a little nicer to run in a, in a you know, typically some breweries can be smaller. You don't want a large piece of equipment there making a lot of noise. Uh, and everything is stainless steel, food grade, fully CIPable. And you can see our master brewer here on the right is very happy. He just had a new centrifuge installed and, and he's ecstatic uh, waiting for the next batches. He's going to run through it. And then some other applications, uh, just as an FYI, I mentioned them a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, but we can use centrifuges for fruit juices, vegetable juices, carbonated, non-carbonated drinks, uh, milk and dairy, essential oil, oils and stuff like that. Uh, remember, for a clarifier, we're removing solids from a liquid stream. Uh, we can also do separators, which can separate liquids of varying densities. So we'll take separate two liquids from each other and then also have some solids coming out of there. And here you can see some different configurations, uh, some different models of centrifuges we offer uh, for our smaller friends in the brew industry. Uh, we have our SE 101. It's about 15 hectoliter per hour capacity. These can be turned down 30 to 50%. Uh, hopefully you all end up someday needing something like a SC601 where you're running uh, 400 hectoliters per hour through your centrifuge. So uh, this is why I'm here. You don't need to digest all, all of our, our range of units, but uh, you can come to me with your application. We can talk about it uh, and see what fits in best for your process, how fast you need to transfer tanks, you know, how much stuff you have in it. You have a lot of grains typically or a lot of hops in there. There's a lot of yeast you want to separate. Uh, that's why I'm here to discuss that with you. So talking a little bit about uh, Trucent. Uh, Trucent is based in Dexter, Michigan. Uh, they're our partner uh, for spare parts, uh, all genuine uh, SPX, Cytel brand parts. Uh, they can turn these spares around quickly as they're needed on site. They assist us with uh, commissioning support and troubleshooting support. So uh, from the mo moment you uh, offload the centrifuge on site, uh, they'll be there uh, to help you get it started. And then after, um, when you need to troubleshoot things, figure out how it's running, why it's running the way it does, uh, we'll look to them to, for support. So uh, you can always feel free to reach out to your uh, preferred channel partner, and uh, they will work with us and we will get the service and parts you need uh, sorted out. With that, we've reached the end of our presentation. Uh, I appreciate you listening and taking the time out of your day uh, to, to listen in. Uh, I recommend now you reward yourself with a beer, if but maybe you're rewarding yourself with beers through the presentation to make it a little more interesting. That's cool too. Uh, my contact information is, is up here on the screen. Uh, my email, jeffrey.timbro at spxflow.com. My phone number at the bottom, 860-205-3470. Uh, now we'll have our uh, Q&A session where, where we'll look at the questions that you have submitted. And once again, if you're shy to submit a question right now, just follow up with me and we can talk about it offline. Thank you and uh, thanks for hanging out. Now let's get to the Q&A. So we had some uh, questions coming through. Uh, let me get to them, let's see. Uh, Jason had one, uh, Jason had a couple. Uh, thanks Jason for, for being attentive. 
Uh, first one is, are there any retrofits that need to be done to the centrifuge in order to work in different applications around the brewery? That's a little bit of a complicated question. Um, <clears throat> so a centrifuge is, uh, we always talk about volumes. Um, and all the applications, we're talking about volumes. And when I say volumes, I mean uh, volume percentages. So, you know, in a case where we're trying to remove grain or eat, uh, flocculated yeast or something like that, or, uh, you know, recover beer from, from the troop, uh, we need to think about the volume percentages. So, uh, you know, the actual beer makes up 90% and our solids are gonna make up 10%. And those metrics are used in determining um, which centrifuge model uh, we need to choose. So depending on the balance between those, we're going to choose different models that are different sizes, that have different sludge chambers and, and, and hydraulic uh, specifications, you know, the amount of fluid you can actually run through them. So uh, long answer dancing around it, but no, there's not retrofits. Uh, if there's different applications around the brewery, we're going to want to work with. Uh, we're going to want to define those at the beginning, define the solids and the liquid percentages in volumes and determine which one will work in all those areas. Uh, so another question I have is uh, for discharges, uh, how do we uh, optimize the, the timing of discharges? So assuming we don't have uh, uh, turbidity sensing, uh, which would be you know, an option we can get where we, we put an instrument in line to see what the solids look like coming in. Uh, assuming that's not the case, uh, assuming we went for a more economical model uh, during commissioning, uh, we're going we're gonna to see how the centrifuge is performing and we're going to program those discharges to occur. So uh, those can always be adjusted. That would be the role of uh, in a more manual machine uh, in having a sight glass there. Uh, you would watch it and you would mainly go into the HMI and adjust your, your timing uh, of those discharges. Uh, another good question, what are the benefits to different centrifuge operation styles, belt driven versus direct drive? So the energy transfer configuration, as I'll call it, um, that's not an option uh, besides the direct drive. Uh, belt drive versus gear drive, that's, that's determined by the size of the machine. So as we go up in our model sizes, uh, we make the choice to go to one drive or the other. Uh, we do offer direct drive uh, for some select capacities, and uh, direct drive offers uh, increased energy efficiency. If you remember, uh, you're going to lose just because friction and inertial forces and all that physics stuff, um, we're going to lose energy. So with a direct drive, we're eliminating all those intermediate uh, components, which are going to kind of pull energy out of the process. And instead, we're transferring energy directly from the motor into the bowl that's spinning. Uh, another good question, uh, do you find that there is a significant risk of chill haze formation post centrifugation, or does the centrifuge remove most of the polyphenols and proteins? Uh, that's going to matter again uh, on, you know, so, so when you get the haze, it's, it's a precipitation. It's actually something falling out of solution. I uh, think the reason that happens is when you're very warm, uh, it, things have an easy time staying dissolved. As you cool a solution, uh, and I forget what, what the term was I learned in college, but basically uh, the solubility goes down. So it's harder for something to stay in, so in a cold solution than it is in a warm solution. So you can't remove something uh, that's dissolved uh, with a centrifuge. If it's dissolved in the fluid, uh, you know, if we want to if we want to remove that haze, we're going to need to cool it. We're going to have to, those solids precipitate. Ooh, my dog's knocking on the door. Sorry, he's a needy little guy. Um, and also, he really wanted to learn about centrifuges, too. He doesn't want to miss out on these wonderful questions. Um, so, yeah, uh, we're going to want to address those when they precipitate. When they enter the solids phase, that's when we're going to remove them. Uh, so we would plan to do that, you know, if we need the centrifuge after we do our chill. Uh, in which brewing companies worldwide do we have Cytel equipment installed? Can that serve as a reference? Uh, before uh, kicking out names, uh, you know, we, we have our list. Uh, I can provide some references, but I, it's better for everyone that, you know, if somebody is not willing to have their name shared that I, you know, clear it with them first. But we have 
a few hundred centrifuge applications, um, several hundred beer centrifuge applications installed worldwide. Uh, a large portion of those are in the United States and uh, we are working in the Latin American market. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions. And uh, don't forget, let me go ahead in the chat for everyone. I'll drop in my contact information. So you can follow up with me if you think of, uh, after a couple more beers, if you think of another question you want to ask me or uh, tell me what a wonderful job I did, send me a beer or uh, inquire about a centrifuge, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm here all the time for you to talk about these. Uh, my email's there and I'll drop my phone number as well, uh, just so you have it. Uh, you can call me or text me. You can send me a picture of your application, uh, a competitor centrifuge that you want to replace because ours is, be is better. Uh, that's all good. Um, but I think with that, the questions have petered out a little. So once again, uh, please feel free to follow up with me. Uh, any questions or comments? Um, thank you again for joining, taking some time out of the end of your day or beginning, depending uh, where in the world you are. Um, and yeah, uh, wish you a great evening, great morning, great afternoon. Thanks again.